afternoon uh, and welcome to this next episode of Governance Dialogues, a program that I have the pleasure to host. Uh, for those of you who are joining us again, um, it's a pleasure to have you um, back uh, amongst our audience. My name is Alisa Cole and I'll be your host today. And th today's episode will be exploring an issue that uh, we've so far not um, delved into at any great length, and that is the issue of sustainability. And of course, um, the word sustainability as uh, its uh, sister term, ESG, is very much used and sometimes perhaps uh, misused or overused in financial press when we talk about um, uh, corporate strategy these days. Uh, and of course, it's an interesting, uh, it would be interesting for us today to delve a little bit further and, and ask ourselves some questions around what does sustainability actually mean? Uh, are we just talking about environmental sustainability? Uh, is biodiversity, for instance, a part of that sustainability strategy? Over what horizon um, are we discussing corporate sustainability that, of course, uh, C-suite um, executives are looking to very much looking to integrate into corporate strategy, and of course boards, um, and that that's part of the reasons we're here to to, to uh, gather today. Boards are also um, uh, charged to oversee um, sustainability risks, and those risks, as we all know, are rising. In particular, the war in, in Ukraine has has um, uh, put a number of uh, important geopolitical risks back on the agenda of in the boardrooms. Uh, with important questions that are being asked as to whether those geopolitical risks have actually been adequately factored in um, to uh, various corporate strategies and uh, inter alia and into the sustainability strategies. So um, that is our quite, I think, ambitious agenda for, for today. And to discuss the issue of uh, sus corporate sustainability, I've invited um, Daniela Favolce to join us here um, today from Berlin. Daniela, uh, uh, from Frankfurt, perhaps, uh, sorry. Uh, welcome to the program. Hello, welcome, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And I would uh, love to be with you in Rome, <laughs> yes. rather than Frankfurt. That would be, that would be, uh, I'm sure that, that we'll, we'll make that happen in the near, in the coming uh, weeks and months. But for the moment, um, for just uh, for the purposes of our conversation, I'd just like to say a few words uh, around uh, why I've invited you to join us today and a little bit uh, about your uh, impressive uh, trajectory. You're a partner in, in Henger Müller, which is a German law firm that uh, advises corporate clients on corporate capital market uh, legal issues, M&As, and other issues. And for uh, the purposes of our conversation today, of course, it's most interesting that you are part of the German uh, Corporate Governance uh, Codex Committee, and that is the uh, committee that oversees uh, rules and regulations uh, dealing with corporate governance in Germany. Um, and you are also an author of a number of uh, reports and articles, uh, thought leadership pieces looking at governance and sustainability in Germany. And in fact, uh, we are here today to, to talk about one of them, which highlights the, um, I think in a very um, stark way, if I can use that word, uh, the importance that the German boards uh, place on the issue of sustainability uh, and disclosure of their sustainable strategies. And I think that the number that captured my attention was was um, that basically 76% of the of the uh, of the executives and and board members that you've surveyed reported to have changed their strategic orientation to um, to uh, to refocus more on sustainability issues. Um, and so that being said, let me sort of uh, delve into uh, the nuts and bolts of this conversation and ask you um, what is perhaps, uh, what are perhaps the drivers that are uh, turning uh, board members' attention towards the sustainability issues in a way that perhaps we haven't seen until now? Well, um, thanks again, Elisa, for uh, inviting me. And um, as you uh, rightly point out, I mean, sustainability, it's um, a topic that is very much uh, on the agenda these days of uh, German corporates. Um, and uh, this is happening in a very, very specific way. Uh, and as you mentioned, we have conducted uh, this recent survey together with the Deutsche Aktien Institute on the sustainability transformation of German corporate uh, landscape. And we have uh, interviewed and uh, sent surveys to board chairman and supervisory board chairman and CFOs. 
as you said, I mean, many companies have changed their strategy. Uh, they have, that I find also very fascinating. Almost all of our participants, 93%, uh, indicated that they expanded their reporting and they expanded risk management. Now, um, what, what does it show to me, to us? Uh, it shows to me that it is more than just lip service. I would describe uh, it as a wish, a will, and a reality at the same time. Now you ask what are the drivers? And I would say uh, the dynamic in this sustainable orientation of the companies is by no means um, solely due to the regulatory pressure. That's certainly there. But um, rather, I would say reputational considerations and also a heightened sense of responsibility plays a central role, almost 90% in each case uh, answered uh, in that respect. And last but not least, I mean, tangible business considerations, um, be it innovation potential to cost savings. This may not be on the short term, but midterm and long uh, term, uh, this is certainly relevant. Uh, so these are all um, uh, important drivers. And to sum it up, I would say corporate um, German corporates have fully embraced uh, the transformation process. And uh, this is for a multitude of reasons, yeah, intrinsic and external. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for, for that sort of broad introduction and, and um, some of the, the key conclusions. And I would like to maybe follow up with a couple of questions. You mentioned uh, reputation considerations, regulatory considerations, and I'll come back to that in a second. But if you look at the, the broad survey of, uh, of executives and board members that you've interviewed, are there particular examples that uh, perhaps stand out as very interesting examples where companies are really sort of um, taking a, a big leap um, in the last few years? Yes, I would say so. Um... Um, I mean, I, I do not want to mention in, in single out individual uh, companies. Perhaps sectors. But, yes, uh, not, and, and that's the interesting point. It's not only sectors. Um, we have had the discussion in Germany about remuneration. You know, what are KPIs, relevant KPIs for the remuneration of board members? And a couple of years ago, this uh, you had only seen financial KPIs. Now, almost all of the companies, not only the large listed companies, the, the DAX 30 or 40, um, as we have it now, almost all of the companies have uh, also non-financial indicators. Uh, and that is that are social um, uh, topics, um, uh, environmental, uh, of course, um, climate change, uh, CO2 reduction, and so on. This is one um, example where you see the change. Another one is a sustainability committee um, on the boards. Uh, a few years ago, this was uh, maybe one or two companies had a sustainability bayrat or advisory board, something like that. Now you have more and more companies having a specific sustainability board. Why is that? I think um, it shows that this is one of the key topics and you need expertise and you need to uh, bundle the expertise uh, and have it not only in one person, but have a number of group of persons. Uh, so just, um, you know, basically almost every day <laughs> you see um, another company uh, announcing that they have introduced a sustainability board, uh, which I think is good. And, and those boards, and I may, may I ask, those are separate from what you would normally have as a, a corporate governance or remuneration, yeah. remuneration committee. So they, they are actually with a, with a, uh, entities or board committees with a with a separate mandate, if I understand correctly, uh, they, they are subcommittees of the uh, supervisory board. That's on the. Uh, I mean, as you may know, we have in Germany the two tier um, uh, system, and uh, you do have, of course, um, uh, on the management board. You also have a sustainability. It's their day to day life uh, that that is a part of it. They don't have so much separate boards. You maybe have a um, sustainability officer uh, that uh, some of the companies do have, uh, but on the supervisory board level, it's rather new, and um, we will see more of that uh, for sure. 
Interesting. Um, and so I'll come back. Uh, I'd like to come back to some of the drivers you were mentioning earlier, which are reputational, but, you know, heightened sense of responsibility, but also um, I think we can't ignore the sort of the regulatory drivers. Uh, they're not the, the only ones, as you as you as you point out, but also important consideration, uh, of course, in the form of EU uh, corporate sustainability uh, directive, which uh, requires, for those of you who may be not familiar with the full content of it, um, audit of reported information and for this information to be tagged and in order for it to be, let's say, uh, benchmarked or be ready for uh, for comparability uh, by institutional investors. And I would like to perhaps um, delve into that a little bit further and ask you what um, impact has that uh, uh, directive had so far on on let's say, real behavior in the boardrooms? Well, I mean, it has, um, we have various uh, directives. I mean, you mentioned the reporting, but you also, um, uh, the reporting directive. I mean, we have uh, in our boards already, um, I think this was already a topic we uh, boards have been familiar with. The rules uh, will be, um, I mean, the, the requirements uh, will be stricter and there will be additional reporting obligations and so on. But this is not something entirely new. What creates um, more, uh, I would say, um, maybe nervousness or concern is uh, the um, initiative on the European level on a sustainability a corporate governance directive. And the idea of that was, of course, uh, to simply um, to induce the companies uh, to rather concentrate on the long term value than uh, short term benefits. Um, that is the idea. It's wonderful, but it's a very difficult undertaking. And you see it if you look at the legislative process. Um, how difficult this is. I mean, the commission uh, here uh, in, in Germany, everyone was waiting for it, uh, for the draft already last year, sustainable mm -hmm. corporate governance, you know. And um, it only was introduced this February, no longer under the watchword sustainable corporate governance, but it's now the corporate sustainability due diligence. And um, while most of the German corporates are positive and open when it comes to the reporting directive, they are very skeptical and very critical when it comes to the CSDD. And um, why is that? I mean, just to give you maybe one or two examples, um, for most of the companies, you know, um, subjects such as having a sustainability strategy, that's nothing new, they have it already. They have to devise this voluntarily. Now, the European directive would formalize um, this into law, uh, what, is, what has been done. Now, you can wonder, you know, what's the point of it? If you have done it anyhow, what's the point if now the European uh, Union wants to formalize it? Well, this is because this leads to standardization and a standardization which is very complicated. Uh, basically, you have to comply with the uh, European taxonomy and so on. And the way how you can define sustainability, I mean, that's the concern, is narrowed down to be compliant with uh, Paris uh, Climate um, Change Agreement and with you, uh, European taxonomy. And um, it, it kills sort of the entrepreneurial spirit, um, which is also necessary to bring about, uh, you know, the, uh, this change uh, in sustainability and, and to keep up the dynamic. So that is one of the concerns. Another one is uh, due diligence, you know, many, many due diligence requirements um, and stricter due diligence requirements would be uh, introduced um, with respect to the supply chain. And many say, okay, that's fine, because then we have a clear level playing field and so on, uh, that's super. But on the under, other hand, you know, you have a lot of practical and legal difficulties then in, in um, bringing it about and uh, to incorporating it in your day-to-day -day work. In particular, you know, this is not only for the big DAX companies, <laughs> this is also for relatively small companies. 
so these are some of the concerns. Another one is enforcement uh, by, by stakeholders. I mean, we have um, we all hear and can read about the climate uh, change class actions. Um, if you formalize everything, if you make it very uh, narrow, very strict, of course, there is always um, the fear that you will have increased litigation and um, you never know what will be the outcome uh, in court. You know? mm. But it, it, it's interesting that you've highlighted this, these two uh, examples of these two uh, EU uh, projects, essentially. One having been received relatively positively and the second one, from what I understand from you, uh, perhaps with more skepticism as, as yes. something that takes away um, kind of national uh, interpretation or national way of, of codifying or seeing it or even company specific way of, of defining sustainability and, and making it more legal, which might be interesting for you and your uh, in your legal practice, but but makes it uh, challenging from what I hear from your for for board, board members and, it, and and for executives. It's also interesting this issue that you mentioned of supply chain and, and the risks that are inherently difficult to control there. We work with a number of companies also that have uh, international operations and where boards are understandably nervous around the idea that you have to be uh, fully in, in control of some of the risks in the supply chain um, uh, where where components may be sourced from, from Asia, from Africa, from other jurisdictions where these concepts are, um, let's say, not as defined. Um, but I want to, to, to come back also to another point that uh, begs itself, I think, in this conversation, and that is uh, Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, and of course, uh, which has enormously disrupted uh, uh, European economies. I think only today the OECD uh, lowered its forecasts for, for most of the EU uh, members, and there was uh, some announcements made uh, last week at the G7. So it's obvious that um, even though COVID is gone, we're not uh, out, in, out of the woods yet. Um, and of course, in Germany, and but also in Italy, the, the, uh, there's been an impact on, on price of resources that, impact, that in turn impacts uh, uh, productivity and sort of ability to control some of these uh, risks of inputs coming from uh, third jurisdictions. So... I wanted to ask you in particular uh, at this time how the invasion is sort of altered views on corporate responsibility uh, in Germany specifically. Do most companies feel that they need to be uh, sort of minimizing um, the, the amount of resources imported or even operations on the ground? Or, or is there a, conver a real conversation as to what are the limits and um, how far we should go? It's a very relevant uh, question. Uh, I believe, I mean, our chancellor has said uh, the war in the Ukraine uh, has uh, been a turning point, Zeitenwende. And why? Because, I mean, uh, the war has demonstrated, I think, with unparalleled clarity that the foundations for economic and social action can be turned upside down, you know, uh, from one day to the next. So it's a turning point uh, in our um, global political and economic order. And uh, it also shows how close all the three dimensions of ESG of sustainability are. The war at first, you know, it might be seen solely as a social risk. Uh, you have uh, certainly enormous ecological and economic um, consequences also linked to it. The main social risks life threats to Ukrainian uh, population, inflation, and so on. But the social risks become also environmental as supply chains break down. Uh, I mean, we have seen that in, in, Germany, in Germany with respect also to the um, automotive, uh, automotive industry. And um, then it's also, uh, we have the debate as to whether or not the coal phase out uh, should proceed as planned. Um, and this has been brought up again uh, because of this uh, war. Then you may, we ask ourselves and then the corporates ask uh, themselves, you know, um, what, um, I mean, we have not had contingency plans. Uh, so is our risk management uh, perfect? Now, what you see now that all this kind of thinking, what do we have to do, you know, uh, what is up and what is down in the world? Um, 
This can, of course, lead to a number of reforms, um, and uh, it it will affect our uh, energy turnaround. Uh, it will uh, may increase, you know, how we think about the co corporates think about how important it is to pay attention to human rights in their corporate activity. Um, how important it is to um, factor geopolit uh, geopolitical risks in their um, strategy planning and so on. So, I mean, it, it has become clear that you have you have uh, definitely to think long term and you have to challenge and uh, yourself and your strategy ongoingly. What is good today and positive, I mean, uh, solar energy or the coal phase out or whatever, you know, may not be achievable because of uh, geopolitical um, circumstances. So, uh, to cut it short, I think the war has been a real, real disruptive moment and, um, and it has changed dramatically the view of what is sustainable and how important it is to pay attention to these matters. Yeah. I, I agree with you, obviously, on, on a number of points. Um, but to come back to this risk scenario, um, a fact, in fact, uh, you know, we've now had two, uh, let's, as uh, Nicholas Talib would call them, I think he's the one who coined the term black swan event. Yeah. Uh, so COVID uh, and, and the yeah. war, um, some would say they were somewhat predictable. Others would say they were completely unpredictable, but that debate aside, um, and, and you highlight a number of implications for boardrooms on, on, on particularly on the, on, the, on the Russian invasion. Do you think that in the, in the German boardroom, the conversation is looking at sort of broadening the, 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 the sort of the types of risks that boards have um, before relegated as being, let's say, low risk uh, sort of zones mm -hmm. as war and whatnot? Uh, or is it a case of um, reallocating perhaps uh, sort of, uh, you know, one, one risk uh, profile, you know, increasing one risk increasing in profile that being geopolitical risk and perhaps other risks, uh, you know, then taking slightly uh, lesser importance. So, uh, you know, is it a case of everything sort of growing cumulatively and becoming part of, of, a, of a broader pie? Um, or is it the case of some risks really rearing their heads out of the woods and perhaps other risks being a little bit uh, relegated, meaning, you know, if, if we have to deal with geopolitical risks, then perhaps, you know, as you mentioned, coal is no longer as, as much of a priority in, in some way because we now have to deal with, you know, bigger other fish to fry, if I may say so. Certainly. Uh, I mean, I would say both is true. <laughs> Of course, the, the order of priority has changed a little bit, and that's always normal. I mean, when we had, uh, when we were at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, the situation was challenging, but digitalization was the key topic, you know. And now uh, it's also how you um, ensure your supply chain, how you ensure your uh, energy supply, and so on, is very, very important. But I think it has increased generally the awareness of thinking about uh, all those effects um, the geopolitical situation has on the company and the activities on the company of the company have uh, on the world as such. And um, we have in the corporate world we have a discussion, you know. What's the purpose of a company? Is the purpose of a company solely uh, to make money and to make a lot of money, uh, the uh, sort of shareholder view, um, maximization of, of profits, or is it to take it into account also all the other relevant uh, factors uh, like diversity, like climate, and so on, human rights. And um, the... Without changing the law, even now, you know, the European directives are not yet in, in, uh, in place, you see a shift in the discussion. So reality also preempts, so to speak, uh, the regulator, because all these 
things, uh, it is acknowledged that a company should take them into account. You know, of course, the company has to make money, but um, in taking decisions, you have to take into account all these other uh, factors. And when we uh, amended, uh, we, we just revised um, the German corporate governance um, code. Yes. And um, we also had the de debate in our uh, committee and in the governance committee. And um, we also made it very clear that sustainability uh, has to be taken into account. You know, how? That is, of course, a question of the individual company uh, because it depends on your industry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it is not that you can say, I don't, this is not of relevance to me. So, mm -hmm. And I think that is very, very interesting because if you read some of the articles uh, in, in, in the legal world from five, five years ago, the, the question was, can you take these factors into account? Now the question is, what happens if I don't take them into account? <laughs> you know? yeah. and this is quite yeah. dramatic. Um. True. Um, you mentioned actually, so one of the points that you were just raising is, is around, and, and uh, it, it's, it's one of the reasons uh, I obviously wanted to, to have this conversation with you, is you're part of the conversation, very much part of the conversation around the German uh, corporate governance code, uh, and how it should be revised going forward. And we we actually work quite a bit uh, as govern to support governments in drafting different uh, codes of governance, whether it's for state-owned enterprises or for listed companies or even for uh, private companies, as it, as we've been asked in, in some countries. Um, and, and these codes, oftentimes, you know, when we have the conversations with governments, they would be interested in the UK code or sometimes in the in the US rules in, 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 in specific regards. Um, and I would like to ask you, you know, given where you sit, whether you think that the governance model of Germany, which is quite particular with the dual tier board, um, that is also used in, in, or in, as you know, obviously is in place in other countries, to what extent it's, in your view, exportable or can serve as an inspiration to, um, to other countries uh, looking to revise their codes in the same way as, for example, you know, the UK model with the, the minority uh, director representing shareholders can be used as kind of examples uh, of interesting protections or examples of interesting regulatory um, aspects that can be uh, uh, brought, uh, let's say, imported for the lack of a better word, uh, in other countries' laws? I think um, because we have the two-tier board system, um, we, I would say we have greater independence uh, maybe uh, of, of the controlling um, corporate body, the supervisory board. So, and I think that is exportable, um, not only to companies uh, like, you know, Austria, Switzerland, uh, or Japan, who have modeled their governance system according to the uh, German one, but in general, um, if you have a one tier board system, I mean, it's, it's always you have um, management and controlling function in one body. And it's sometimes, of course, there are conflict, um, conflict rules and so on. You can deal with it. Um, but I think the two tier system that we have and the, all the rules that attach uh, to it, they are, they are elements that uh, could be exported or could serve as a model um, because in particular in you know, challenging times, it's uh, very, very important to have a certain a barrier mm -hmm. align between management on the one hand and the control body on the other hand. And of course, yes, uh, you do have uh, lead independent directors in the UK. Um, we have that I think only in one instance here in Germany or in, it, it's, it was not a success model here. Um, so the idea kind of is the same, to have independence. There are various ways to achieve it. And I think our model is also could serve as an inspiration. <laughs> you now, of course, uh, in some countries also, what's interesting is that, you know, the regulators or the law allows for uh, for both type of boards. I yeah. think it's the case, for example, uh, one of the countries I, I've done quite a bit of work is in Morocco, and there is a possibility of having either 
kind of the dual yeah. uh, the dual single uh, uh, tiered board and i think it's it's in their case it's more of a legacy of french uh, law having some influence on on their legal system but but obviously I mean, provides options we we do have the possibility i'm advising right now a client um who wants to go public uh, soon and they um envisage uh, company structure that is that is monistic you know it's a european company but of course um incorporated here in germany so it's a monistic se you don't see that that often uh, puma has been monistic um a european company um and in, in in certain structures it's just the right thing and nevertheless you have to implement and make sure that this independence and the control function is really uh, maintained you know yeah i think we could probably do a have another episode we could dedicate on dual and single structure yeah. single tier boards because it, it's such a such an interesting um and fascinating subject but for the purposes of time, um, I would like to perhaps ask you one um, kind of closing and perhaps controversial question around Wirecard, which uh, obviously is, is a subject that's been uh, more than discussed in, in, in Germany, but also internationally. Um, and especially given your role, kind of looking at uh, the, the, the local code and how it might evolve um, in light of uh, some conclusions and sort of, let's say, soul searching um, following Wirecard. I wonder if you have sort of some thoughts to share with our audience on how you think that that particular case has changed, uh, well, on the one hand, the, potentially the regulations going forward, but also kind of corporate behavior or um, aspects of it. Um, yeah, I mean, Wirecard was uh, a shock. Um, <laughs> I think to everyone here in, in uh, Germany. And of course, it led to an immediate reaction um, of the regulator. Um, we have, uh, the regulator has introduced a, a Wirecard action plan. And in the end, it resulted in new uh, laws, uh, corporate laws, amendments um, of our commercial laws. Um, and it concerns, of course, in particular, the audit of companies, uh, the relationship uh, between company and auditor. Uh, it has on top uh, naturally also led uh, to a change of the German um, corporate governance code. We amended it uh, and, and it's part of this last uh, revision amendment that for instance, uh, the requirements um, or the expertise of um, of, of the, the members of the supervisory board are stricter. Um, so you, you do have regulatory changes. And um, what I'm a bit, uh, and, and there is more awareness also by, by everyone, you know, but the question is, is a new law always the solution? And uh, because you always think if there is a scandal, oh, maybe the old laws were too lax. And I see the risk a bit, and if you always introduce a new law, then you have a very soon over a, a regulation. And um, we should also remember, I mean, with Wirecard, as long as the share price was high and was right, no one, not even the investors, really were concerned that Wirecard did not comply with many of the rules they were, that were already in place. Um, uh, under the German corporate uh, governance code. They, they simply said, we don't comply. It, there is no need for us to comply. There was not an outcry, you know, investors nevertheless bought the stock. So I think it is um, as important it is uh, to sharpen laws and to introduce also new uh, laws. It is also important that we take seriously what we have. You know? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that in the sense that we've seen and it's interesting you, you know, in the Wirecard case, it was a similar reaction, yeah. obviously with a German flavor than we've had after Enron and the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, and um, kind of also the focus on, on auditor responsibility and sharpening that in, in laws and, and responsibilities of uh, of senior executives vis-a-vis -vis financial reporting. So um, definitely kind of a food for thought as yeah. to how, how <laughs> regulators in, in a way do react um, 
in some ways similarly uh, to, to completely different cases and how we, we do in fact go and, and think that changing laws is generally a, um, kind of something that generally happens after these sort of large corporate governance scandals, which as you interestingly point out, nobody really looks at until they become uh, a, a scandal and then they become a corporate governance scandal. So it's, uh, it's, an, interesting, um, it's an interesting thought to, to retain for our audience. And, but I would like to, to thank you for, for, um, for, and for the comments you've shared with us today on, on, on these various topics. We've canvassed kind of quite a lot from EU directives to um, some local um, German market evolutions and coming episodes we'll be looking at individual mm -hmm. EU uh, uh, countries, we'll be looking at Italy and others and exploring uh, various corporate governance mechanisms that exist in place and that are being um, shaped and modeled uh, following these uh, various crises that we've, we've had over the last two years. So I, I invite you to stay tuned uh, to these conversations and uh, thank you, Daniela, for, uh, for your time and for sharing your, your thoughts. And I'm sure we'll have you uh, back on the program in the future. Thanks again for having me. <laughs>